So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Sherman, as you probably know, and I am delighted to welcome you to another curatorial conversation here at the Warburg Institute. Um, the series was started a couple of years ago now to provide a space uh, for discussion about, and, and candid discussion, about interesting exhibitions, gallery projects, museum work. And we've recently ranged from the material culture of food through the pathbreaking paintings of Artemisia Gentileschi to the collecting of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, some of our most popular events have given us behind the scenes views of entire museums, including the Fitzwilliam and most recently National Museums of Scotland. And I'm particularly excited about today's curatorial conversation because it takes us behind the scenes at an institution that all of us know, but very few are uh, able to say much about, they haven't really seen very much of it up close. And that's because in part, it's not a public museum, but the buildings that house the UK's parliament. And our guide is Melissa Hamnett, known to uh, many of you from her years in the Department of Sculpture, Metalwork, Ceramics and Glass at the DNA. But since 2019, the head of heritage collections and chief curator for the Houses of Parliament. Uh, we worked together at the VNA very happily. And as soon as I heard about her move to Parliament and to Westminster, uh, I have been dying to hear much more about what it means to have moved from being a curator in a place like the VNA to being a curator in a place like Westminster Palace. Um, so I'm super happy that she's agreed to, to join us to talk about this and just tell us a bit more about her work and about her collections. So as usual, uh, she's gonna start us off with an introductory presentation. And uh, then I will ask some questions to tease out the issues. And finally, we'll have plenty of time uh, at the end for you all to ask any questions that occur to you. Uh, so you can either, I think, type them in the chat uh, if that is available or our usual practice, which is raising your hand, which is now most easily done uh, in the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And you can find raise hand very easily there. But plenty to hear before we get to that point. So without further ado, Melissa, I'm gonna ask you if you would to actually, oh, we are, we're already viewing your screen. So I think you can just take it from there and I'm gonna spotlight you so I disappear. And I think you can do it now, you can go. Brilliant, um, thank you, Bill. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a real, uh, it's a real pleasure to um, be part of this series, and um, thank you also to all your colleagues at the Warburg. Um, John has been fantastically helpful in all the correspondence, so um, very grateful uh, for him to him as well. Um, as I said, um, I'm going to uh, do a little introduction about. Um, my role and uh, the building and and the collections and um, and it's a sort of start of a ten, I guess. So um, so that Bill can uh, can unpack those issues and and I thought that one of the best ways to start would would probably be to talk about the building that we often refer to as the Houses of Parliament, um, when in fact we actually certainly from within Parliament often mean more than just the Palace of Westminster. Um, so here we go. There we go. Um, so I, all of you will undoubtedly be aware that the Palace of Westminster has been the heart of British Parliament for some 500 years. Um, and the present neo-Gothic uh, structure came about our a catastrophic fire in, in 1834, um, when the architect Charles Barry and um, Augustus Pugin put in a winning proposal to, to redesign the building. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting because um, it's widely sort of assumed that the Gothic revival was inherently backward looking um, and that, that therefore the the, the palace is some sort of symbol, I guess, of reactionary, um, even feudal maybe, political outlook. 
Um, but in fact, the, the Gothic revival was actually seen by many, many architects to be much more flexible than classicism in, in meeting the needs of the 19th century. And um, in this way, today's palace was seen through really modern eyes, um, both in its construction and in its services. Um, so it, it's interesting to, to reflect on that in, in the 20th century. Um, as I mentioned, we often use the term the Houses of Parliament um, instead of the Palace of Westminster. But in fact, the, the parliamentary estate is a real complex of buildings um, which extend far beyond the, the Gothic Palace. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the bottom left hand image. Um, where you can see that the, the buildings within the vicinity of the palace from Richmond House um, and Normanshaw North at the most sort of northerly top part of, of the image at the bottom, um, right down to Seven Millbank in the most southerly end. And items from the heritage collections are on display or in use across almost all of these buildings. But of course, what, what you're probably really keen to understand a bit more about is um, what are the heritage collections? Oh, I'm one back. Um, so the heritage collections, um, there are actually six collections at UK Parliament, I should start with. Um, there is the parliamentary archives, um, and there are two libraries, one for each house, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Um, and then there's what we jointly refer to as the heritage collections. And that's the three blocks on the left of the slide here. Um, and they comprise the parliamentary art collection, the historic furniture and decorative arts collection, and the architectural fabric collection. Um, and all together, there are 26,000 items um, in those three. Um, they are publicly owned um, and accessible via palace tours and increasingly uh, digital tours, um, but also through uh, the open house scheme and various exhibitions um, as and when they are on often in Westminster Hall um, or Portcullis House. Um, now the the, the interesting thing that, that Bill mentioned is that the collections, um, as well as the libraries and the archives, are all housed within this sort of internationally renowned site of, of architectural and cultural significance. Um, and in recognition of this, the, the Palace of Westminster, along with uh, Westminster Abbey across the road and St Margaret's Church, were inscribed as um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987, which has um, both benefits and challenges, and we can pick up on some of those uh, a bit later. Um, Bill uh, was saying to me, you know, what, what's the difference between being a curator at, at the V&A and being a curator um, at Parliament? And one of the things I thought I would draw back on, and, and actually quite a lovely thing, I think, from a historic point of view is the legacy of, of this post. Um, the first curator was actually identified at Parliament in, in 1852, when, when the Royal Fine Arts Commission began its work making the, the new Palace of Westminster a treasure house of art. Um, and so the role in many ways began as a custodian really only for the parliamentary art collection, um, which at the time was quite traditional in its holdings um, from, from what we hear today, largely paintings, drawings, uh, engravings and, and statues. Um, and then by the mid 20th century, the role was, was formalized to not just provide adequate care of the collections, um, but also expertise and um, quite crucially uh, in, in, the, in the historic papers, the maintaining of a catalog. Um, um, but it also involved um, advising the speaker, the Lord Great Chamberlain, on the purchasing and commissioning of works of art um, where they should be displayed. And uh, to, to some extent, that still holds true today. I'm, I'm the principal advisor to, to the Speaker and the Lord Speaker um, and advisor to the Works of Art Committee 
in both houses. So that's um, a, a sort of a par partial view into the governance, I suppose. Um, now, in 2019, the, the role and title of curator was integrated with the new role of head of heritage collections. And um, this role uh, has responsibility now, not just for the parliamentary, but also the historic furniture and decorative arts collection and the detached architectural fabric collection. Um, and, and it was given a kind of wider strategic uh, role in, in having an overall vision, um, but also ensuring that um, policies and standards were um, increasingly impro approached in a, in a more comprehensive and standardized way. That we were um, similarly approaching engagement in the same the same manner. Um, so let's look at the collections. The parliamentary art collection has over 10,000 objects um, and they now um, have moved on from their perhaps more traditional origins of painting and drawing and sculpture to prints and digital art and textiles, ceramics and, and much, much more. Um, and actually an astonishing percentage of the collection is in use or on display throughout the estate. And um, just drawing your attention to the slide here, items range from medieval sculptures in the top left, which date from when the Palace of Westminster functioned as a royal palace, um, to the uh, image just adjacent to that, where um, works of art were specifically made for the Houses of Parliament as part of the Fine Arts Commission, um, to then much more modern and contemporary artworks commissioned um, more recently. Um, and if you look on the top line on the far right, uh, we've got an example of the election artist Adam Dance output. And again, we can talk more about that later. Um, so the collection captures key moments in British history, which was seen to, to really shape the politics, I think, from, from the 19th century onwards, um, and which actually continue to inform our um, political views and activities of um, both previous parliaments and the current parliament. Um, and they actually, in, in that way, are um, a very living document. They, they show us the and they really document the institution. Um, so uh, in many ways, they also obviously contain um, portraits of parliamentarians, but also political influences and um, really rather nicely staff um, who've shaped parliamentary history. So we've got fantastic um, images of Hansard who capture um, the activities in the chamber. Uh, oh, go away. Also got the architectural fabric collection, and this contains over five thousand items commissioned for the palace, um, and most of them date back to the time when the building, the new palace of Westminster, was originally constructed. Um, although there are some some medieval items as well. Um, the collection ranges from architectural models, as well as um, stone details and um, fantastic metalwork and woodwork, um, but also interior panelling, um, fabrics, wallpaper, um, and other items which are perhaps less common include stained glass, where it survived. Um, much of the Second World War bombing meant that the stained glass wasn't um, kept in its entirety. Um, and one of the most uh, ubiquitous examples, I think, of the architectural fabric are the Pugin designed encaustic tiles. And you can see them down on the bottom um, where, where, the, where the Minton Square is, um, is visible. And, and the tiles often incorporate these fantastic Tudor rose or fleur-de-lis um, symbols. And they were laid in the palace between 1847 and 1852. And, um, some of them have been restored or repaired over time, um, but those that um, are still in their um, sort of 
full integrity are um, housed. We have a sample of each design within the architectural fabric collection. And I think it's, it's probably really important to note here, actually, that when the palace was built in the mid 1800s, um, Pugin was appointed the, the superintendent of works and he was responsible for all the designs of wood and stained glass and tiles and metalwork. Um, and, and the interior really matches with his true principles of um, both the decorative finishes and the design of the room interior itself all being seen in, in, as one complete whole, if you like. And then we've got the uh, historic furniture and decorative art collection. And there are about 11,000 items in, um, in this collection. And many objects are in everyday use. And I think that's a really um, key difference to, to bear in mind from, from a museum that these are, these are objects that aren't behind glass and um, they are working collections. Um, and nearly two thirds of the uh, furniture and decorative art collection was designed by Pugin. So that's a, a, high, um, a high percentage and gives you an idea of his role within the palace interiors. Um, and then about 16% was designed by Giles Gilbert Scott, who furnished the, the bombed areas of, of the House of Commons after the Second World War. Um, and he actually, in quite a lovely continuity, um, carries on the Gothic revival theme in, in a lot of his interiors. Now, the, uh, the historic furniture and decorative art collection has some really, really unique objects like the monarch's throne in the Lord's chamber um, and the peer's sideboard, which is a fantastic piece of carpentry in the Lord's, um, but also uh, a wonderful table um, designed by Gil Gilbert Scott, um, which has ribbons of wood from 12 countries of the Commonwealth. So you really get a sense of how the objects speak of parliamentary history. And um, in many ways, this collection, the Historic Furniture and Decorative Art Collection, but, but actually all three, um, capture and maintain the corporate memory, I think. Um, and, and they help explain the functions and processes of parliament from, from the ceremonial to the day to day. And, uh, and today I was in a workshop with some colleagues um, and I, I have to bring this um, to the fore today, but a colleague said um, they take the tangible and they, i.e. the objects being the tangible and they, and they make the intangible, so the, the politics and the legislation behind that and the processes tangible. So it's taking the intangible and making it tangible um, uh, through the objects. And I thought that that way of viewing the collections um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very practical way um, was a really lovely, lovely point to bring to, to today's talk. Um, finally, what does the Heritage Collections do? Um, so the team uh, provides a bicameral service to, to both houses. Um, and in many respects, you know, like a museum, we are um, conserving and caring for the collections on and off site. Um, and as part of that, we are, of course, researching and um, interpreting the collections, uh, both for digital outputs, uh, increasingly social media, but also um, research outputs, publications, um, and exhibitions and displays which take place in, in the main buildings. But again, you know, there are some very practical items about uh, practical elements um, of collections management uh, and documentation and cataloging and loans and object moves are all very similar to, um, to the sorts of things that, that take place in a museum. I think the key difference is that the Houses of Parliament is, um, is a working building um, and front and center uh, is the business of both houses. So um, in that regard, um, the collections sit in a very different place perhaps than, than you would think uh, in a museum. Um, and not only are they a record of parliamentary history, I think one of the really, really interesting things to constantly uh, bring to the fore is that they're being used by parliamentarians today so they continue to grow and change and be inflected by um 
by the culture of um, the change of legislation and by the changing use, in fact, of, of the building. So I'll stop there One so second. that <laughs> Bill, you can take over and uh, interrogate. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and we can, um, we can talk more. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. I'm gonna just, I'm getting a lot of audio feedback there. Um, hopefully that'll settle down. Yeah, that's better. So Melissa, I'm just gonna leave this uh, image up if that's okay. And sure. I'm spotlighting both of us so we're alongside your image. And I wanted to leave this image up um, partly because it kind of undoes my question, as you said uh, here at the very end, you know, if you look at that list uh, of activities from your perspective, actually not much has changed most of the functions of being a curator. Maybe the job description uh, hasn't changed very much for the curator, but the context in which you are curating is fundamentally different. And the phrase that I keep coming back to or latching onto is when you said right at the beginning that there are, and it was your very first slide, you said that there are objects from the collection on display or in use in multiple buildings. That second part of that sentence or in use, you would never use in most museums, some museums. And of course there are handling collections or educational collections. Some museums are very much about use and, you know, um, rural or, you know, mu museum of English rural life, you know, there are museums that are devoted to that. But I think in general, one of the things that really strikes me and I'm really curious to hear more about is how much of the stuff you're looking after uh, is to be used and is in use and actually used in quite charged circumstances. So if it breaks and it's something crucial for the government uh, ritual uh, or even not just ritual, but, but policy or, or enactment, um, you know, what happens? So can you talk a little more about that, about, about what that means for you about you know the, the use side of things yeah sure um i i can um completely confess that that moving from you know major national museum into a working building with working collections was a real change for me um you know as, as you said the notion that these things are not behind glass but they are part of the process of the day-to-day um, and, and just talking about, uh, you know, the interaction um, with these objects, I can, I can take an example of something like the dispatch boxes, um, both in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, of course, which are accessioned objects um, as part of the collections. The, the, the ones in the Lords are um, slightly more uh, ornate with some fantastic gilding on the leather. Um, and um, I'm sure everybody has seen sort of up close shots of the dispatch boxes in in the Commons chair. Um, and of course, from a from perhaps through the eyes of a museum professional, um, we're always trying to advocate, uh, the, you know, that the public don't touch things, that uh, their their hands affect the the patina of the objects. Um, and and in many ways, you know, might might fundamentally um, change them. And actually, where your where the sort of lens changes, I suppose, with a working collection, is recognizing that almost that interaction brings and charges the objects in in quite a different way. I mean, it 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 activates them as being active objects. And I think um, that's really something that from an engagement point of view um, is something that really brings them alive. Um, so yes, there is definitely um, a, a, a flip side to that, if you like, which is that the collections care um, has to take quite a different approach. Um, and that approach is both um, a more practical one in acknowledging uh, 
how things are going to be used um, and what, what mitigations we can put in place and what mitigations we um, or, or what activities we need to, to remedy, perhaps. Um, and that can also be to do with uh, the location of objects. And, um, and actually we've, because of the very working nature of the building, you can find that the way that you do collections care has to fundamentally change. Um, so perhaps within a museum, um, you know, if you needed to conserve a painting, you would take it off a gallery wall, you would put a temporary removed label in place um, and you would trot it off to the conservation studio. Um, and often within a working building, your opportunities to access the objects, furniture, works of art, et cetera, um, is very much dependent on the business of the houses and when you, yeah. can, um, when you can get access either to rooms or to particular spaces. And actually um, on the slide that you see on the screen here, um, we've actually got two conservators who've taken a painting off the wall within a committee room um, and are, are doing an annual examination and, and surface clean. Um, and so some of the approaches have to be a bit more flexible. Um, I've actually got a great shot here, if I just go on. Um, this is on the top left, there's an image of the Royal Gallery. Um, and among probably the most famous pictures uh, in, in the Palace of Westminster are these two monumental um, water glass paintings by, by Daniel MacLeese. And it was a really, really pioneering technique. And um, Prince Albert, you know, brought a lot from, from Germany as you would expect. And, and actually this te technique was being pioneered in Germany. Um, now, uh, obviously through, um, Excessive years of uh, dust accumulation, dirt accumulation, the fact that the Palace of Westminster actually has one of the most incredible uh, ventilation systems throughout the palace. Um, there is a, a sort of air processing through the spaces that meant the surface of the paintings had dulled substantially over time. Um, and and, a, and a, a huge bid was put in to endeavor to undertake a big conservation program. Um, but of course, doing that in, uh, in a gallery that is used, it is used for ceremonial functions, um, the piers go through there. It is also part of the line of route. So um, the public go through there. And it's not a space that um, in, akin to a museum, you can just kind of close off the access whilst you carry out your conservation. Um, and actually from an engagement point of view, we made it a fantastic opportunity um, because a bit like, uh, you know the the Attenborough series where you see the kind of how did he how did they make that fantastic filming of animals underwater? What everybody loves, I think, in museums and uh, historic houses or, or cultural institutions is to see the behind the scenes. Um, and so we had these ginormous scaffolds up for um, long periods of time while we undertook um, the conservation and. The other opportunity that was afforded was actually to work with two um, academic institutions, uh, Cologne University uh, and uh, another research body um, to really examine the techniques that we used. So we, we made it a really collaborative effort. Um, and, and for that, um, we were really able to, to undertake some, some really groundbreaking work, but it really wasn't easy. And it had to be done in, in stages because the impact of the space was, was so great. Um, yeah. and, and the other shots here, I mean, give you a, give you a sense of that. The other question, this, wow, this um, audio is really bad. So I'm just curious, actually, if we can follow up, and that's a really brilliant um, answer to, to that first question. But I think another, another side of the question that, that you'll have interesting things to say about is also about, about who uses them. So normally when we say uh, viewed uh, in a museum, 
even used in a museum, it's the visitor who counts. It's all about the visitor. It's visitor engagement, visitor numbers, visitor spend. In your case, you've got down on the lower right on that slide, uh, a committee chamber where you know the, the MPs are presumably doing their, their business, uh, but using your objects. And so I'm curious about, in a way, who you're, you're more responsible to in this case. Is there a, a visitor audience? And what is their relationship to the actual professional MP, policymaker, uh, government people who use the building? That's a really good question. Um, there is very much um, a, uh, a visitor and a public audience, um, both phys physically in terms of tours of the palace and, and digitally in terms of digital tours and, and website uh, access. But there is very much a recognition that um, a lot of what the collection does um, enhances and adds to um, the spaces that they're in. Um, and, and sometimes, um, you know, that sort of embedded history of um, items having been part of discussion, I suppose, um, does mean that their use is led by that internal audience um, and, and our responses um, can also be, be driven by that. I mean, um, as you, you rightly picked up, um, this particular committee room, um, many of the uh, historic furniture items are, are being used and being sat on. And I think it, it's, it's a, really, um, a really important uh, element in, in both acknowledging the challenges of their care, but also um, ensuring that those internal stakeholders have as much understanding of the, the kind of cultural and historical significance of these pieces that, that they too, you know, are aware and respect them within, within the building. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess that so, was my silly, yeah. my silly question is, do you ever go around and tell people not to sit on something or, I mean, can you tell <laughs> off, you know, Boris for, for misbehaving with objects that are in your care? <laughs> Um, I wouldn't tell Boris, um, sure but, uh, <laughs> but well, I think I think sometimes there is um, there is an element of education. Um, I think there there is um, I think the difference of the internal audience is where in a museum people are coming in and art is front and center. That's the, the purpose of their visit um, and the reason that they've come there. Um, often what you can find in, in a historic interior like this is, um, you know, the, the, art and, the art and furniture is not front and center. Um, and, and sometimes it's easy to forget that. Um, and, uh, and for that, I mean, I, I would, say that I think there are um, many members um, and also staff because many of these uh, items you know sit in uh, public staff places across the um, across the estate um, you you do find that there are those who really love and champion the collection and those who um, sort of I don't know it's almost a, a daily thing that that passes them by so I think there is as much as that external advocacy of the collections and wanting to highlight um, to the public the, the wealth of the collections, there's also a real um, need and desire to ensure that the internal um, stakeholders recognize and appreciate um, the kind of material culture that they're, um, that they're sat around. And I think actually that picture of the Lord's Chamber um, it is really indicative. I mean, you've got some of the most fantastic electrotype sculptures and and um, and, and wall paintings, um, and and just by the very nature of the frequency through which peers are probably in the chamber, it becomes a sort of standard thing. So um, often, what we like doing, both on a public and a, an internal level, is is drawing people's attention back to the kind of specifics um yeah. and i think that's something that we will continue to always do um and actually through the through the committees that's a wonderful 
means of championing um, the importance and the recognition of, of collections care and use and, and what the implications are there. That, that's really great. Just one, one last question along these lines, if you don't mind, and we can just be fast about it. But um, I suppose the thing that I remember feeling about the collections at the V&A is my sense of worry, of the, the pressure of, of really fear about damage or loss, most of which, of course, didn't happen, and most of which I had no control over anyway. Um, in your case, you've got, I mean, I suppose the two things I was most worried about in the VNA were use by some visitor or person, which you have all the time, and the other is security <laughs> issues because, you know, it's. A, a security threat, a terrorist uh, site, et cetera. Now, I'm as, assuming you have that in spades. You know, you probably yes. have uh, a, a highly elevated sense of security at most points. Um, and so how, how do you square that? How do you live with that? <laughs> um... I, 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 you know, I think it's a really, it's a really difficult one because there's an immense level of responsibility um, yes. with that. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, often what you do know at the v is that things stay in a particular place. They're always in gallery nine behind a, a case. Whereas, you know, the mace moves in and out of the chamber as part of a, a ceremonial process. Um, and I think part of the way of how you square that is it's not just on your head. Um, so there is a very collaborative um, role, I think, of um, all of the staff within the administration, a, a, real, a real trust and a real collaboration of um, understanding the importance of um, both the procedural aspects, I suppose, that involve objects and how you ensure their security. Um, and also just from the kind of security staff. I mean, you can imagine and, and you'll remember all too well. And, and in fact, COVID is a phenomenally good um, testament to this, which is every organization has to have, every building has to have a business continuity plan. Um, and, and that's something that we are constantly working on. You know, it's a really live thing. Um, and that is as much from a security point of view, but also from, I would say, one of the biggest challenges of, of the palace is water ingress. Um, you know, this is a 150 year old building, um, more than 150, 170. Um, and, uh, and it is it is not uncommon, you know, to to have um, to have water ingress. And I think um, one of the aims of of restoration and renewal um, is, in some ways, to see if a more comprehensive approach to uh, to some of those more challenging maintenance issues can be undertaken in a in a um, an overarching way because so much of the maintenance to the building um, happens when the house isn't sitting, if, if it's in really kind of critical places. So it's a, in, in, in answer to your kind of initial question, it's very much a shared, um, a shared challenge. I won't say a burden because I, I would, um, I'd like to think that <laughs> collaboratively, um, there's, there's no feeling of burden, but yes, it is something that you, you have to learn to look through a different lens yeah. um, and, and, and you have to also accept a, a level of damage, I suppose, because yeah. um, it, it's not so much damage, but just the, um, the, the day to day use um, that naturally incurs um, a change to the object. So you, you have to see it as a very living, developing thing where the history of that use becomes integral to the history of the object. Exactly. That's really articulate. Thank you. Can we talk a little bit more now just about the nature of the collection and yeah. a little bit about the past before we go to the future or the present? Yeah. And I'm, I'm really curious about that year 1852, again, for obvious reasons, which is DNA was also created that year and, or the 
South Kensington Museum be became a v &A, uh, by, I think, some of the same forces, probably even some of the same people. Um, yeah. And I'm curious about this emphasis on art at that moment. What kind of emphasis on art is it? What was that person, your first predecessor, supposed to be gathering by way of art and for what purpose? Sure. Um, so um, interestingly, because the fine art, after the building was completed, or in fact, before the building was entirely completed, because of course, Barry and Pugin, um, like so many architects, continued working on the building when, um, when people had begun to think about the, uh, the, the fulfilling the fullness of the interiors. Um, and so the, the Fine Art Commission was um, established in 1841. Um, and what begins is um, a, a huge range of competitions, really, to, um, to commission artworks across, across spaces. And many of them um, hark to uh, periods in, in British history. Um, some of the wall paintings, uh, you know, have very, very literary themes. Um, and there's a real sense of um, empire, I suppose, um, of championing, you know, the British nation. Um, interestingly, of course, with Prince Albert uh, leading the commission, um, there aren't entirely British artists involved all the time, but of course there are, there are a, a predominance of British artists. Um, and so the role of the curator, interestingly, was less about um, purchasing art or commissioning it at that point, but caring for that which the commission brought in. Um, and, and that I think is a really interesting thing because it's not until much later, and of course the Fine Art Commission was actually active for many, many years, um, and parts of the building like St Stephen's Hall, um, they had an original scheme but it was never developed, and then uh, you know, when the Fine Art Commission was dissolved, they, they looked back to that space and thought about how, how um, works were going to to be filled and, and you then have um, very active speakers of the house who became quite involved in uh, the commissioning of art as well. So um, some of the early references to the curatorial role are, um, are really wonderful and they talk about, you know, basically ensuring that the, the paintings and the statues don't have dirt on and you're, you've effectively just got to go around and dust them. Um, and, and as the role develops in the 20th century, I think that uh, that acquisition and development of the collection becomes a, a real, um, a, a much more live part of the of the role, so to speak. Um, and, and I think that's a testament perhaps to the fact that the commission did so much commissioning um, that 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 part wasn't uh, a driving force for the for the curator at the start. So speaking of commissions, commissioning, <laughs> do you still commission art now, or does someone still commission art now? Yes, yes, very much so. And in fact, I think that's um, I think that's something that. Um, is really important to to make people aware of is that you know um, the the committees for works of art um, actually have been actively pursuing not just a, a kind of collecting policy but a um, a, a commissioning policy and um, and an engagement policy I think of of projects as well as commissions. Um, that are not just to reflect modern day parliament and the activities um, therein, but also quite consciously to address the unbalances inherent in what is predominantly um, a Victorian collection. Um, and I've actually, I've got a, another um, slide that we can, we can look to here. Um, and I thought uh, I could I could just pluck some of these out to to discuss. Um, there has been for for many years, and I would say um, certainly for the last twenty, um, but but perhaps more 
since the Good Parliament report in, uh, in 2016, a real active strategic um, desire to, uh, to develop the collection in a way that represents um, women um, and other re underrepresented groups. I think there's a, a clear understanding that the, the parliamentarians of the 19th century, um, because of the way uh, Parliament, because of Parliament's makeup, um, were populated mainly by by white men, and um, and that's something that you you have as a very sort of factual reflection of 19th century Parliament. So um, more recently, I think, um, and as as the political makeup of Parliament has changed, there's been a real desire to reflect the individuals and the changes within Parliament, and on the um, on the bottom right of the screen, you've got a, a wonderful photograph of Yvette Cooper um, by the contemporary photographer, Hannah Starkey. Um, and this, uh, this image is um, one of uh, many that were exhibited in 2016 as part of an exhibition called 209 Women. Um, and it was, it was a project to highlight um, women firsts i suppose um and so there were lots of uh female female photographers who took pictures of female firsts be it, be it the first female archbishop or um you know the first female mp of a particular constituency um and not only did parliament uh put on this fantastic exhibition in in portcullis house um, but the uh, the parliamentary art collection then accessioned um, a number of those items into the collection. So, so that was a sort of a real marker. Um, the image directly above um, of of a of a stained glass installation um, is one of um, very few abstract pieces in the collection, perhaps. Um, and again, it has. Um, a really fantastic background and this was uh it was an it was a, the result of an artist in residence um and the artist was mary branson um and the residency culminated in um the creation of this stained glass window which actually um is permanently set into the historic fabric um, and it's when you come into Westminster Hall and you turn left into St. Stephen's Hall as you go towards Central Lobby, um, there's a, a huge archway that you pass through and this stained glass window is, um, is, is installed there. Um, and of course, having touched on the, the UNESCO nature of the building, it's no mean feat to uh, not only commission an artwork, but then put it into a listed building. Um, but the work is phenomenal in itself because it reflects um, the campaign for women's suffrage um, in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, and the little individual glass roundels um, refer to acts in the parliamentary archives, rolled acts. Um, and it has a really, not only does it have a really poignant message within it, and I think the fact that it was installed um, to to really celebrate um, women's right to vote, not all women initially, of course, but but um, but certainly initially uh, more. Um, but the the wonderful thing as well is that the the stained glass roundels change. They change in re in reaction to the flow of the tide of the Thames. So. Um, there's a very site specific nature of the commission as well as um, recapturing the, the essence of um, so many objects in the collection, which is, you know, sort of reflecting legislation and changes um, that the whole nation have, have benefited from. So they're, they're just two, but um, others um, yeah. that you see here are, um, are also uh, as significant, sometimes commissions, sometimes acquisitions. Um, and uh, in the bottom left hand corner, um, there's uh, the output of another um, artist, Cornelia Parker, um, probably far more known to, to many on the, on the talk. Um, 
but Cornelia Parker was one of a host of election artists. Um, and since 2001, um, the, uh, the Works of Art Committee have commissioned an artist to, to follow and document each general election um, and to create a permanent artwork in, in Parliament. And we've just got some of the most brilliant outputs of that, um, of that process. And, um, and also um, not just the outputs, but the process that lead to the output. So um, Adam Dant, uh, who did one fantastic uh, piece, had these fantastic sketchbooks um, and we've just actually accessioned the sketchbooks into the collection because, of course, he's he's referenced all the huskings. He's he's sketched um, constituencies all over the UK. It's a really, really in really interesting insight into the process behind a general election that so many of us probably aren't aware of. <laughs> um, oh, so, yeah, they're, they're just a few um, examples.